Hello and welcome to this PodMedics podcast on ulcerative colitis. In this podcast we're going to cover the epidemiology of ulcerative colitis, pathology, clinical features, investigations, a little bit on some of the scoring systems that are used, and then finally the treatment modalities. So let's start with epidemiology. The first thing to say is that ulcerative colitis is a common condition and you'll certainly see it in your practice as a junior doctor, both in a medical and a surgical setting. If you want to get more detailed, the prevalence is roughly 150 per 100,000. The typical patient will be middle-aged, either male or female, but it's useful to note that there's a slight female preponderance. In terms of smoking, you should be aware that smoking is in some ways protective for UC, although of course you never recommend it for the prevention of UC. This is in contrast to Crohn's disease, where smoking is a risk factor. In terms of pathology, we can look at both macroscopic and microscopic features. For macroscopic, the typical pathology is continuous involvement of the colon and rectum with no strictures. Microscopic is often something that comes up in exams, written exams usually, and the things you want to look for in questions are this characteristic triad of mucosal inflammation and crypt abscesses, shallow ulceration, and marked pseudopolyps. So, let's talk now about clinical features, i.e. the symptoms and the signs. As always, we divide up symptoms into systemic and specific. This is a whole body inflammatory condition, so in terms of systemic, we see malaise, anorexia, and weight loss. For specific, often there is bloody diarrhea, there may be abdominal pain, particularly lower abdominal pain, as well as rectal symptoms such as tenesmus and fecal urgency. Let's move on now to signs. When you're thinking about signs and learning about them in the context of a specific disease, always think as if you were actually examining the patient and group them in this way. This is important because when you come to actually examine patients, you'll get into the habit of noticing patterns of disease. So, starting with inspection. The patient may be very thin, reflecting a degree of weight loss. They may have a fever if their ulcerative colitis is flaring at that particular time. The abdomen may appear distended. And also, they may have signs of an operation, as as we'll see later. Many patients have operations um, following ulcerative colitis, so they may have a stoma bag in situ. Also look for more subtle things, such as erythema nodosum, which you'd most likely see on the shins, and pyoderma gangrenosum. Looking at the hands, this is a condition where clubbing may be present. Moving up the arm, up to the face and the eyes. Ulcerative colitis is a systemic disease and can affect the eyes in a number of ways. The three most common things are iritis, episcleritis and conjunctivitis. For the abdomen, once again, look at the abdomen and see if it's distended. And also note if there's a stoma in situ. Also note the presence of any tenderness. Okay, moving on now to investigations. Let's use the Podmenics investigations table here. So, for cultures, if the patient presented perhaps with sepsis or with a fever, you'd want to consider doing blood cultures. You'd also want to consider doing stool cultures, as often coexistent infection in the bowel can worsen the symptoms of ulcerative colitis, and patients with ulcerative colitis are much more susceptible to these infections. For bloods, you'd want to do a standard set of bloods, Particularly, you'd want to look for any signs of inflammation. So in the full blood count, you might see a raised white cell and you might see a raised CRP. Patients may also be anemic. And you'd also want to have a look at the LFTs because patients can lose a lot of albumin through diarrhea and therefore they may have low albumin on their LFTs. In terms of imaging, we're going to see more imaging in a moment. But the key imaging investigations are an abdominal film, a chest x-ray. More advanced ones may include a CT abdomen and also gastrographin enemas, or indeed barium enemas. For scopic tests, you consider perhaps doing colonoscopy and biopsy, and we'll see why that's important in a moment. So, in terms of the abdominal film, the thing you're really looking for is this toxic megacolon. And you can see here is an example of an x-ray with toxic megacolon, and the key figure to remember here is greater than six centimeters diameter. If you saw this, you'd want to refer to the surgeons pretty quickly. You do a chest x-ray because these patients are at increased risk of perforation. 
And as you can see here, there is air under the right hemidiaphragm, which indicates a perforated intra-abdominal viscous. More specialized investigations include barium enemas. Now, the classical feature on a barium enema that you can see in this x-ray is a loss of the hastral folds in the descending colon. And this is often referred to as lead pipe. Other more subtle abnormalities can include thumbprinting, which represents mucosal thickening, and pseudopolyps, which represent regenerating islands of mucosa. In terms of severity, you should know that there's something called the true love and wits criteria. And this allows you to classify ulcerative colitis into mild, moderate, or severe. I don't think it's necessary to learn all the features of this table, but you may wish to learn the six elements of the true love and wits criteria. These are the frequency of defecation, the presence of any blood in the stool, the presence of fever, tachycardia, anemia, and a raised ESR. Okay, let's talk about the treatment of ulcerative colitis now. So, there are lots of different situations which ulcerative colitis patients present with. These include an acute presentation with severe colitis. They may include a patient who presents perhaps to the outpatient, who has bad symptoms but doesn't require admission, and for whom you'll want to use a remission strategy to try and get their disease under control. There'll also be patients who have stable ulcerative colitis who require maintaining. And then finally, ulcerative colitis patients often do require surgery. So you need to know about the different surgical techniques that may be used in the management of these patients. Let's start with acute severe colitis, perhaps graded using the true love and wits criteria. For the management of this, you want to consider this like any medical emergency. So of course you take an ABC approach with resuscitation and particularly IV fluids as these patients may be very dehydrated. You want to try and control some of the systemic and local inflammation and this can be done using hydrocortisone. For example, hydrocortisone is often given in UC both IV and PR. You'll also want to consider thromboprophylaxis in these patients. After admission, patients should have monitoring of their vitals, of course. They should have regular bloods, looking at some of the parameters we spoke about earlier. They should have a stool chart. And also, they should, of course, have abdominal x-rays looking for the presence of toxic megacolon. The next situation to consider is that of inducing remission. This may be in a patient who is admitted with acute severe colitis to the medical team, or indeed a patient who presents to the outpatient's department, perhaps for the first time. So we can broadly divide this into oral therapies and topical therapies. For oral therapies, the first line treatment is five ASAs, and the second line would be prednisolone. Topical therapies depend upon the location of the disease, for proctitis, we can simply use suppositories, but for more proximal disease, we may need to use enemas and foams. In terms of maintenance, patients with UC are often on five ASAs, and the most common five ASAs you'll see are sulfasalazine and mesalazine. You'll also occasionally see patients with UC on azathioprine, and this is particularly for patients who relapse while they're on sulfasalazine or mesalazine. Finally, let's consider surgery. So, surgery is really, really common for patients with UC, either in an emergency or an elective setting. So, let's first consider the situations in which emergency therapy may be necessary. The first thing to say is that 20% of patients with UC will require surgery at some time, so it's fairly common to see this. The complications for which surgery may be considered and the surgical team will need to be involved include toxic megacolon, which we saw earlier on the abdominal film, perforation, which we saw earlier on the chest x-ray, a massive hemorrhage, and finally, failure to respond to either the oral or topical therapies that we described earlier. Patients with UC often also have elective surgery, and this can be due either to chronic symptoms that do not respond to treatment, or for colonic carcinoma or dysplasia, which is often associated with ulcerative colitis. So, in this podcast, we've done a very quick overview of ulcerative colitis. I hope you found it useful.